Okay, it works. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm glad to see such a packed audience. This is early morning. Um, my name is Luc van Dijk. I'm very pleased and honored to uh, talk to you here today. Is my slide up yet? Can anyone see what I'm presenting? Ah, now I can. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, I gave a talk on Monday on uh, why we're doing AI in the cockpit, and today I want to talk a bit more about what exactly it is, what we're doing, a bit behind the technology. Um, so uh, I hope to entertain you for at least 30 minutes and then uh, have a Q&A session uh, where you can ask absolutely everything. Um, so uh, our story opens uh, quite a long time ago when cockpits looked like this. Let me see if you actually see what... Yeah, I trust you're seeing what I'm seeing. So cockpits looked like this, and in those days there wasn't a lot of reason to look at your instrument panel a whole uh, all of the time because uh, there was you know much more interesting things going out outside, such as finding out where you were, uh, where everybody else was flying, and where you could land. And now uh, our cockpits look like this, and we have all these instruments, but these fundamental tasks of uh, seeing where you are, seeing where you can uh, fly, and seeing where you can land are still very much. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the task of the pilot uh, with his, eye, his or her eyes and visual cortex. And we've reached some sort of a plateau where we can add more instruments, but they'll just add to the information overload and they just make for systems where the pilot has to decide you know, if this signal is trustworthy or not, um, if it fails, you know, if the GPS is switched off over Nevada for some reason, you, know, you still have to be able to find your way. If things don't show up on ADSB, you're still not allowed to fly into them, and you're supposed to land on everywhere uh, without an ILS uh, nonetheless. So piloting has remained uh, a very multitasking task where uh, there's only so much you can do by adding instruments that just uh, present more information. Um, so what we did is uh, we took the CPL skill test uh, to look at what it is exactly that a human does uh, when uh, he or she flies to pass a check ride, and we thought, what if we made instruments that truly uh, can make a dent in that workload? And that's going to require, you know, the sort of thing that you call AI. Now, before we go too deep into uh, what we actually do, we have to make clear that AI is a marketing term. So in the 1950s, it meant stuff that we can almost but not quite imagine doing, like playing chess, whoop de doo And um, uh, 50 years later, it was playing the game of Go, which turned out to be a lot harder. And so you know, it, we don't help ourselves when we talk about the AI wants to land or the AI wants to uh, avoid planes. That's, that's just silly. Um, but uh, a number of things. Uh, so it's better to talk about a set of techniques that we call machine learning. And when we look at that, uh, actually, in the last decade, a couple of problems that were open in computer science for uh, 50 years have become feasible. Uh, like, you know, is there a cat in this picture? Or where is the cat in this picture? Or, you know, what type of things are in this picture? Or where exactly are these things? And these are techniques we can fruitfully apply to, you know, Driving, where uh, people have been promising self-driving cars for quite a while now, and you know the disappointment is palpable. But uh, it's, there's no denying that these techniques are making a difference in road safety. Now, it's very important to understand that driving is much harder as a computer problem than flying. I'll talk about that a bit more uh, later. Uh, but an example of applying this technique to uh, flying is uh, this system that we demonstrated back in 2018. It uses a downward view camera, and while you fly, it segments that into, uh, just like the cat and dog example before, into buildings, streets, low and high vegetation, a couple other things. Then it figures out if it's flat and big enough, and then it figures out, and, and the certainty with which it knows that, and then it identifies uh, least bad places to auto -rate, rotate to if you at this moment would have a power failure in your helicopter. So that's obviously a useful thing to have uh, in a helicopter. You have about 12 seconds uh, before you're uh, down, so you know if you can shave off two seconds with deciding where to land, that's, uh, for example, with a quarterphonic uh, audio signal, that, that's a useful thing to build. So uh, applying uh, AI techniques, modern computer vision, uh, deep learning, machine learning techniques, to the world of uh, aerospace was the reason I incorporated my company uh, back in 2016. We've been at this for uh, five years now. 
Um, we have uh, big academic components. We have a lot of people that fly. Uh, we have 12 people in Latvia. We're based in Switzerland, uh, where the core engineering happens. And then in Latvia, we have a data annotation office, because that's a very important task, uh, annotating lots of data with ground truth for this type of systems. And uh, we're all having a good time. Um, so what did we do? Uh, we spent these five years building uh, the three core functions of uh, um, flying in VFR. Where am I uh, recognizing uh, the landscape? Uh, where can I fly, seeing all the traffic? And where can I land, it's finding the runway and guiding you towards it? We also have a vertical version of that. Uh, and then half of the work is making it work. And the other half of the work is building up the evidence so that you can show to the FAA and EASA in Europe uh, that it actually works and is safe and is fit for purpose. Um, so that um, has resulted in uh, a readiness, a technological readiness level of our systems that make it now uh, ready to be brought to market. So we're here at uh, Oshkosh uh, with our hosts uh, Avidyne, with whom we partnered to make the actual hardware. So as a company, Dedalian focuses on uh, the software and the AI uh, and the bits that haven't been done yet. And with partner Avidyne, we're putting the cameras uh, and the computing box at a, a D160, D254 certifiable level to apply this uh, um, and bring it to the market. Um, while we're waiting for these systems to become ready and certified, we have an evaluation kit which we've made available to uh, uh, certain partners so they can already uh, play and see that that works and experiment with the integration. Um, so we're actually getting uh, valuable miles out of the system uh, as it already is today. So the hardware we're building with Avidyne consists of this uh, compute box. Uh, it weighs about uh, eight pounds. A little birdie. And another one. Uh, it weighed, weighs about eight pounds, uh, which you you know might think as uh, is, it's quite a lot. Um, but nobody has had to do this amount of computing on an airplane before in you know civil applications. So uh, in theory, my laptop would be powerful enough, but my laptop is not going to survive uh, a, a bit of uh, bad weather and is going to give up at critical moments. So uh, the compute box is going to be. Uh, um, certified to an appropriate level. We're also putting the cameras in a decent enclosure for mounting on uh, your aircraft. A typical system will consist of up to four cameras. Um, it will output position at about uh, 30 hertz. It will output uh, the traffic information. I'll talk about that uh, once a second. Uh, compute, it consumes about 150 watts. As, it, as I said, you know, the, nobody's had to do this much computation uh, in the cockpit before. So uh, we are aware it's a lot, and in the coming years it will come down. But uh, this is what you're going to install. This is going to be largely invisible to the pilot because you know this is all safely hidden in your instrument bay. It's a little cable to your flight display to show the stuff that comes out. So what comes out? Uh, for the positioning, it's a system that, just like a pilot, can look out the window or recognize landmarks. Uh, so we can fly from A to B and from B to A without uh, GPS. You might say, that's nice, but you know I have GPS. But the thing with GPS is it's not uh, so reliable that you can apply it in safety critical situations. Uh, you, know, you may have seen the NOTAMs that a large swath of the US has no GPS today because the military would like to see what it's like if nobody has GPS. So uh, we now have a system that is actually can answer the question, can I trust my GPS? Uh, because it's engineered to be more reliable uh, than that, providing we have visuals. So this is all designed for daytime VMC. So uh, the fun thing is that a camera is a device to measure angles. So a consequence. A consequence of that is that your uh, errors are proportional to the distance away from the object. So we can stay about uh, four meters, uh, sorry, about 4% of your uh, altitude above ground is our horizontal uh, certainty. Actually, I have some slides on 
uh, these these uh, performance characteristics later. So the positioning system works by in two layers. There's a lower layer that does uh, odometry, measuring movement. Um, there's a set of algorithm called SLAM. Uh, they're used in the self-driving. Uh, the the DARPA challenge in 2005 for driving around on Mars was based on uh, this kind of uh, algorithms. Turns out, if you move from one position to the other and your picture changes, if you fire five points in one image that correspond to the other image, you have sufficient number of equations to solve for your own motion and the distance of these points. Uh, and we find you know, not just five, we find hundreds of points from one image to the next because the images come in every 20 milliseconds or so. So we can reconstruct our motion and we can construct a rough 3D map of the terrain which comes in really handy if you don't want to fly into it. So that comes later. Then um, uh, this requires no database. You know, just like you don't require a database to fly from, I don't know, Reno to here, <coughs> and you don't require a GPS, this system will work. But there's one caveat. Um, this system has drift. Because, because you measure angles, you only fundamentally get five degrees of freedom from your position and your attitude. And everything is up to scale. So you need something to fix the scale. And for that, you need to actually recognize objects in the landscape. So we have the second layer on top of the positioning that does uh, so-called landmark recognition. It means you fly once when the GPS works and you have a survey map that you can then the next day or the next week or the next month uh, reference yourself against. And that means if we take off, at some point we recognize the environment and then we snap uh, to this map and then uh, we are localized. So um, that works really well. What can I say? Um, so, yeah, some technical details. It outputs uh, GPS coordinates. Uh, it outputs, like in AHARS, uh, your, uh, your attitude, uh, roll pitch, and yaw. Um, it uh, uses nothing but the camera, so you can mix it in with these other signals and have uh, super accurate positioning. Which comes in, uh, oh, it works in daylight VMC. Uh, we have things on the roadmap to go beyond, beyond that. And uh, this pre-surveying, um, we're working on replacing that with satellite imagery. Uh, which is doable in principle, given uh, some time and money, uh, and it's you know pretty pretty accurate. Um, the second function that we have, uh, which might be uh, of interest to people that flew in here uh, recently, um, is uh, traffic detection. So. Um, not everything shows up with a transponder, or, or not every transponder signal uh, works. If your GPS is you know, blotted out in an area, your ADSB transponder also does not have a position to trans transmit. That's not a legal reason to fly into them. Uh, there's things that don't have a very big radar cross-section, you know, large plastic things that are not metal. Um, and so you are required as a pilot uh, according to part 91.113, to keep your eyes open and each pilot shall remain vigilant to give the proper right of way, it's called, but you know, in practice, to not fly into. Um, and you may notice from your own flying experience, you find on the radio or on your transponder that something should be out there, and you ask you and your passengers, you know, can you see it? And then, so the flying works today because the sky is big and empty. Um, and if we uh, want to you know, increase the safety level to completely root out mid-air collisions, uh, it would be nice if we had a system that could look over our shoulder and see things that we don't have uh, the energy time to pick up because we're multitasking other things. So um, it finds uh, this system uh, analyzes the image, looks at all the pixels, and finds um, uh, the small and big traffic. Um, obviously, if it, the bigger it is, the farther away we can spot it. Um, it's uh, more accurate, picks up more than your average human. Um, and uh, we can see things about 10, 10 nautical miles out. And it says here uh, 10 hertz, but we typically output this traffic uh, once a second to be compatible with your workload. And you know, we could integrate this easily to existing displays showing uh, a different symbol on your ADSB. Among your ADSB detected traffic, we can show this symbol that says this is you know, visual only or visual confirmed by ADSB. So uh, that integrates nicely with the cockpit as it is today. Uh, I have a video that starts to play. Oh, I had a video that I wanted to play. Hmm. I wonder 
I wonder how I can make this play. No. No. Hmm. Maybe if I go to the other screen and I double click, no, also not. Okay, now I'm going to be super annoyed. Sorry, I should have practiced this bit. Uh, does anybody know how to start a video once you are on a screen? Can, hmm? Double click it. Oh. Um, so here it is in action. Right. Here it is in action over beautiful Switzerland where we're based. Um, so you see a couple of examples. I had another one from the, I was, I wanted to show the Oshkosh one. So we, if you come to our booth, we're in Hangar C. Uh, we have uh, fresh recordings from uh, Sunday, the arrival. Uh, our partners at uh, Everdyne landed, uh, touchdown, got back in the pattern three times. Uh, this is a form of self-punishment, but got you know great footage of our system picking out all this traffic uh, in the sky. This is this has to be the best testing ground ever for this kind of thing. So we pick up uh, things about uh, three nautical miles out. Uh, we have confidence that it's an airplane or a helicopter or a big airliner or a small drone. Uh, we do a distance estimate. Uh, partly based on knowing what kind of object it is. Uh, and then we show, um, so the percentage you see, I, I don't know if you can see, there's a little percentage, that's how certain we are that it is in fact a helicopter, but we'll show you also that there is something if we're not sure what it is, because when you fly into it, you don't care if it was a Zeppelin or a balloon. Um, and uh, the distance is an uh, estimate of uh, a minimum, so we think that it's not closer than this, and we, pr we can track up to 36 targets, and we, can, um, we prioritize them according to time to impact, which we can still measure very accurately, even if the distance and the closing rate are not um, uh, super precise. So, uh, ah, here are some more technical details. So uh, we get this video feed, we analyze it, um, we may fuse in other sensors, um, but we don't use ADS-B in any way, so we would do this as a last step to show that you have this similar input. And then we output up to 36 tracks with the relative position. So what we can do better than a radar is measure the angle. So when you see it move, it means you're probably not going to fly into it. So we can eliminate uh, threats by seeing the accurate movement. What the radar does better is uh, estimating the distance. Um, but uh, as I said, we, we still have a fairly good estimate of the distance, and we have a super good estimate of the time to impact. So uh, we can still prioritize the, the, the threats uh, accordingly. Um, so this is a nice example of where we apply this neural network. So people have tried to do this without machine learning, without neural networks. It's this relatively new techniques that you know Google uses to find videos with cats for you. Uh, what it does is it's a method of computation. It's loosely inspired by how neural cells work in your brain, but you know don't seek too much behind that. This is not you know, the dawn of the terminators. This is just a technique to construct filters that can pick up shapes. And uh, to do this, we show it large data sets of examples to say, you know, this is what we call the shape of an aircraft. And if you do that enough, then it turns out you have good mathematical reason to believe that it will do that in the wild. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So this neural network goes over all these pixels. Every, 30, uh, every couple of milliseconds, we get a fresh image. We look at all the pixels. We carefully engineer the system to not use motion as a uh, cue. Because if you do that, you construct a system that's really good at picking up the things that you're probably not going to fly into. And you have no evidence that the things that appear to stay in the same place, meaning they're on a collision trajectory, are uh, picked up equally well. So there's traps like this abound. And it took us you know, five years to get this right uh, with you know, 30 people. So, um, but it works. Um, we, uh, there's been uh, MOPS published recently, Minimum uh, Operational Performance Standards. Uh, that we follow. Um, uh, there are some other relevant standards. You know, I'll hurry along a bit because I want to show the last one. So there's all these standards. We meet them. It works. Um, you have this uh, field of regard. You have the um, declaration range and the closest uh, performance range. And then within that, you want to be 
you know, really an order of magnitude better than uh, uh, human eyes to pick it out. Human eyes is really, really good. So you should not underestimate what a marvel of engineering uh, the eye is. But uh, it works best in the direction you look at, and our cameras can look in every direction all the time. Uh, so it's, you know, like a trusted co-pilot looking over your shoulder. Um, so the third system I wanted to dedicate some minutes to is the visual landing guidance. So uh, you routinely land without any ILS whatsoever. In fact, there's only a couple of hundred uh, airports in the world equipped with category 3B, you know, completely land till touchdown type of uh, landing guidance systems. Everywhere else, you know, there's at least a decision height at which point you have to look out the window, see that you're properly aligned, that the runway is clear. And um, uh, Garmin has done us uh, a huge favor with the emergency auto land which is strictly better if you're dead. You know, if you, you're only allowed to push that button if you're incapacitated, and then, uh, you know, it's clearly better than an incapacitated pilot, but it works by, you know, first of all, GPS, so, you know, you have to be in an area where that works today. Uh, vertical precision of GPS is uh, tricky, um, and then it avoids collision by, you know, broadcasting, this is an emergency, so everybody else gets out of the way. You know, that's not how you want to, you know, how you want your plane to behave. Um, so our system can pick out a runway, again, purely on camera, not using any other signal. Um, we get, knowing where we are, either from GPS or from the first system, we get roughly in the area where we expect the airport, and then our system uh, that you see here takes over, finds the runway, figures out your uh, deviation from centerline and uh, desired uh, approach path, and shows this as a uh, flight director-like uh, interface. So um, what you see here is not, you know, the big screen is not what we show to the pilot because, you know, if you look out the window, you should see the same thing. But the small inset is what we would throw up on the MFD uh, as a confirmation of uh, what we're seeing. And the little cross, if you put the needles in the middle, you'll hit the runway where you plan to. Uh, we have done experiments where it's directly coupled to the autopilot. Look, ma, look ma no hands. Um, and again, let's see. Nope. Nope. Okay. Beep, beep, boop. We want to see some demos. Okay, how did I magically do this last time? I clicked around a bit. Or maybe I went here. Nope. Nope. Ah! This is super annoying. No? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Here we see uh, sped up footage from a flight test campaign in Florida uh, earlier March this year. Um, so the uh, machine learning system is trained, it's called. Um, so you show it all these data sets, but then you want to know that it also works on the airports that you haven't seen. So we had five, data, uh, five uh, runways that were part of the training set. We had another five that it had never seen before. But, you know, it's still Florida, um, so you know, it looks similar enough that the system just worked out of the box. And then we did experiments to try to break it by flying against the sun, uh, fly, and, you know, the, the having uh, around sunset, lower light. Um, so. It uh, works pretty well. What can I say? So um, how this works in practice is, you know, you have multiple runways. So there's going to have to be some form of UI, user interface uh, to pick out, you know, which one. So when you come in, we recognize runways. There's the finder mode, and there will be some uh, user interface element to, you know, click through the options. And then when it, uh, when you've chosen one, and you get closer. Uh, it will lock in and it will find the um, uh, the geometry of the runway and it will find the center line and compute the, the deviation. In the demo videos, at some point you see a dotted line, that's the horizon. Um, you also see this going straight through mountains when there's no horizon view, that's computed from the geometry. So we get pretty accurate attitude uh, and guidance towards, um, towards the runway. Then. There's a, a variation of this uh, for vertical or uh, you know very steep approaches um, that works uh, similar, and we have shown this uh, as uh, pilot assistance on a helicopter, um, but also uh, we've done experiments on a drone to you know land on a 
land on a towel or um, or a stamp, if you will, because uh, remember, a camera gets more accurate the, the closer you get. So um, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll skip over this bit. Um, but uh, again, it works in daylight VMC. Uh, both of them, uh, the uh, runway guidance works with a runway that's marked. So the grass ones are extremely hard because, you know, if you didn't know it was a runway, it could be a field of cows. Um, and um, the vertical landing works with the fiduciary marker or a pre-surveyed photo or anything with enough, enough texture to land on. Um, and the technology behind them is the same. There's a neural network that uh, finds the relevant bit, and the rest is uh, classical tracking algorithms, as you might find in the radar also. Uh, oh, here's some more technical data. So, you know, these things are tested so that if you bank out too far, you know, it doesn't just stop working. Um, so we set these safety bounds on, you know, if you can make it, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, is the philosophy. Uh, and it works when there's multiple runways and uh, for uh, precision and, and normal visual runways. Um, so, oh, it also works in all kinds of weather conditions and in clear weather where the sun is uh, in front of us and behind us. Uh, and all these things are, um, you have to carefully test. And that brings me to the last three minutes of my talk. So these neural networks, uh, these machine learning techniques, uh, when we started the company back in 2016, the general opinion was, oh my god, you know, nobody knows how this AI works, and it's this black box, and it's non-deterministic, and therefore you can never get it certified. Um, so uh, we thought there was an opportunity in uh, clearing up that misunderstanding, uh, but there is actually some serious work to be done. But it's not as bad as it sounds. So first of all, you know, if you talk about AI as the thing we can't really do yet, um, uh, you know, and that, that is very badly defined. Sure, nobody knows how that works because it doesn't exist yet. These machine learning techniques that we apply, you know, if you know what you're doing, you can understand why uh, they work, when they work. And the argument is not, you know, because this number is set to this and this number is set to that, that we can recognize this. The argument is built on the statistics of testing it on a large data set. And in that sense, it's not different than any other part of the aircraft where if you, for example, you have a strut, you know, you put this in a temper temperature controlled uh, chamber, you bang on it 40,000 times, you establish with enough statistical uh, confidence that it breaks, you know, never before 30,000, you put in the service manual, replace after 20,000, and everybody's completely happy. With software, you could never do that because software is very hard to prove correct. But with this specific class of machine learned systems, that type of argument is again possible. So what we did is uh, we approached uh, EASA, the European counterpart of the FAA, with um, a plan to build up this argument. And they invited us to do two research projects with them, which we did in uh, 2019 and 2020. The last one ended uh, last March. Um, there's some trade secret sauce, but we published about 90% of this. We also advertised it in the industry working bodies, a uh, method to uh, certify a machine learning based system. Um, and we are in advanced talks with uh, the local authorities on this topic who are also very interested. Um, so uh, what I like to say is that you can just get a couple of smart people, you know, a couple of postgrads and students, put them in a room, feed them coffee and chocolate until they have a system that works like this. But the real hard work is to do it in such a way that you can build up this argument. So that's where we've invested at least half of our energy. Uh, and I think the fruits of that labor are uh, ripening. And therefore, we hope to be able to sell you this box at Oshkosh next year over the counter. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. And applying for an STC is uh, very uh, near. So with that, I wanted to leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A. So I think that is doable. Um, uh, so did I raise any burning questions in anybody's mind? Sir. You, uh, the question is, have we uh, thought about uh, the experimental market as a way to gather data? Uh, you have uh, spoken out loud our secret plan to get lots of data. So the reason we want to go uh, to the GAA market as soon as possible 
you know, we'll probably sell these first units at a loss because, you know, we want the air miles out there and we want to get the data and we want to get the data and the information back from you that this thing works as advertised. So we'll, when, the, when we do the cert first certification, we'll have the proof that it uh, doesn't make things worse. You know, it doesn't Im increase your workload. It's clearly a safety win. But that it, and that it works on you know the first thousand runways that we surveyed. When you guys go out and visit the other forty-nine thousand runways in America, you know we would like to see if it worked. So probably how it will work when we roll it out is there will be a set of databases. Uh, there will be a database with a set of runways where we have verified it. So where we dare to promise, you know, you can just safely land here and trust the guidance. And then there will be the unverified set where you know you land as normal, but the thing is looking over your shoulder. That they Data does not automatically update your your system in any way. So that's that's one of the you should never have an AI system that learns while it flies. But that data, when you land normally, you know, and it worked or it didn't work, we would like that data back, and uh, you know, we'll make it worth your while. And that way, with the experimental uh, community, we hope to get the coverage for the evidence. Uh, so we expect that it will work. In most of these things, in most of these places, but to build up the evidence, we rely on getting it out to the market, which is why we're in a hurry. Uh, in the meantime, the, the tech and avoid is, uh, is less critical in that respect because um, you know a plane looks roughly the same against the sky everywhere, so that's a clear, that's easy. The background is a bit harder, but it's not so hard to gather a sufficient sample of uh, what below the horizon looks like in America. So I think uh, for that, we would just like to gather the evidence that you know you agree that we saw it before you did. Uh, but so the experimental market is, I think, crucial to get this out before we can do anything more ambitious. Sir. Yeah. Very good question. The question is uh, if we have to redo the survey every season. So we gathered uh, our first map uh, early next year, early last year, uh, at the end of winter, start of spring. We collected uh, first year of data throughout the seasons and the weather conditions. Uh, we found that we can fly in winter on the spring map, but it's better if we make a map out of the data that we got the whole year, and then we have a map that stays valid at least a year. So, and also it, it gracefully degrades. So if your map becomes worse, so these landmarks we recognize, they're not of the form, you know, this big tower or this big river. They are points in the image that we have a high, that have, that look so interesting, if you will, that we have a high probability of uniquely identifying them or sufficiently uniquely identifying them when we come back next week. So it's, uh, it's a couple of hundred points per kilometer, per square, per square mile. Forget that I'm in America half the time, um, and um, so it doesn't. It's not that it stops working. And you fall out of the sky. The number of points you recognize slowly decreases. So we have a live safety health metric, uh, how well it works. But this is also. Um, we think this will naturally scale if we get the data back from the rollout. It will naturally scale with where people fly. Um, and we are working on making the first layer available from satellite imagery, so you, we don't even need the survey. And if it's so, if you don't know where you are, you go up, and then it beca the problem becomes easier. So the, f the higher up you are, the easier it becomes to recognize where you where you are. So that's always a fallback mechanism. Um, I think I answered more than your question. Actually, I think I gave away some trade secrets, but you know, don't tell everybody anyone about this video, and we'll be fine. Do I have more burning questions? Sir. Ah, so yeah, if you don't see the terrain, you don't see the terrain uh, and it doesn't work. But with this global recognition, you know, if there's a hole, we might snap back. There's a simpler version of this problem what if we fly over water. So if the water is too big and we see no uh, uh, land, then we only have attitude. Um, so, so for that, uh, you know, it's hard to beat uh, GPS. Um, but uh, as soon as you, you, know, you, you see enough blobs of land to recognize, we should do at least as good as you uh, in a similar condition. But you know, we're not a replacement for uh, IFR gardens. Ah. Uh, 
So, sorry, can this system be made too? No. Um, so apart from the survey flight, uh, where it would be nice, but it doesn't have to be your survey flight. And, and we're working on uh, alleviating that constraint. So our system is designed. So let me go back to that first slide I put up. Let me find it. Have I shown so many slides? This one. So you know, this is still to this day a legal cockpit, and and so we've engineered a system so that it complements everything that you do if you have a cockpit like this. That was our starting point, and because the. Uh, a human is a fantastically reliable and creative um, you know, pilot. Uh, so some things they do really well. Uh, one thing they do not so well is spreading their attention. In fact, if you look at the CPL skill test, or uh, probably also the PPL skill test, um, properly spreading your information is, uh, is one of the things that's, being, that's, that's actually being tested. So uh, we designed our system so that as long as you have one eye open, and one hand on the stick, you know, you're allowed. To, you, you you should be able to land. So our system is the one eye open. Uh, as long as we have a visual on anything with texture, we should be able to get you safely to the ground. That was the design goal, and I think we I think we reached that. Because otherwise, you know, you just have another instrument that can fail, for which you have to be trained for the failure mode. And um, yeah, sir. Right. Uh, yeah, now I have to f go forward through all these slides again. Damn. And now I have to start this video again. Uh, maybe it starts automatically if I don't touch it. No. Um, well, if it magically starts for some reason, which would be nice, then uh, you will see, oh, this is, sorry, this is the wrong one. <laughs> uh, uh, I can't see my cursor in this slide, so I don't actually know where I am. Uh, it looks like a flight director. The picture I'm looking for is the one where, ah, there's my mouse, uh, is the one, Ah, that's my daughter. Uh, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, okay, so you saw this cross in the top of the in the top of the there. Uh, so you see this this flight director like interface. So currently uh, we're above the glide slope, and if we come down or we get closer, uh, we get closer. Then now the cross goes into. So if you put these two lines on the dotted line, so this is like a flight director coupled to an ILS. Uh, fun thing is that an ILS gets less precise if you get closer, but a camera gets more precise if you get closer. So we're we're we are pretty uncertain when we're four nautical miles out, but but by the time we hit the runway. You know, we can. Uh, we have to actually correct for the fact that the camera is a bit out on the wing, because otherwise you land with the wing in the middle of the runway. Um, you can see here the effect. So we will just feed this. So the um, this big screen obviously, you know, should be the same as what you see if you look outside. Uh, so there's no point in you know distracting you with that in your glass cockpit. The flight director will be, you know, like where you see your ILS today. Um, maybe we can do some auto things, but that's for later. And then what we want to do is to make sure that you can trust the results. So we want to th throw that inset that you see at the bottom left. We want to throw it on the MFD so that you have confirmation that what we think is the runway is also what you would think is the runway. And uh, same for the tech and avoid. You know, before we make you worry about flying into something, we're going to show what it is that we think it is, so that you can have uh, confidence that it actually works as advertised. Did I repeat the question? <laughs> Maybe I didn't. Uh, sorry. If somebody wonders what questions I answered, I'm happy to answer the question. What question I answered? Are there any more questions?
Okay. Ah. Oh, yes. Did I not? I thought <laughs> maybe in my eagerness to start. Uh, so I had this, com this one in the middle. We are the Dalian. We're a company based in uh, Zurich in Switzerland. Um, uh, because nobody can type this consistently, the website is ddln.ai. Um, and uh, my name is Luc van Dijk, and I am the founder and CEO. And um, some of my talented staff are with me. We're in the booth next to Avidyne in Hangar C. Um, and uh, did I answer your question? <laughs> Okay, so ddln.ai, come visit us uh, at the booth ne next to uh, Everdyne and ask any more questions that uh, you may have burning in your mind. Thank you.